Hi, and welcome back to Britain's Hidden History, Kreutzor. Now, I got very lucky this morning. I was browsing through a uh, second-hand bookshop, and look at this. I got this amazing huge book, Peter Aykroyd, London, a biography. I know uh, Rob Shaw's a big fan. He mentions it in Architecture of Power about the 17th century stuff. I got it for three pounds, hooray. It's almost 800 pages. It'll depend how long I live on this world if I get through all of it, but I'm more interested in the old stuff. So, um... Uh, well, I did live in London for quite a few years, and I'm going to try and read as much as I can. Right, now, the first thing he does in here is crush this idea that this is a Roman city, all right? He explains, he goes way, 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 way further back. He actually goes back to Neolithic times, Paleolithic, talks about um, a pottery bowl from the Neolithic period, unearthed in Clapham, all sorts of stuff. And so we go through all that, and he says the key feature has always been the two uh, great mounds, uh, which are known today as Cornhill and Ludgate Hill. Now, he then talks about, um, yeah, this bit, my, a sentence I love here. I have to swallow the Celtic thing, all right? When he says Celtic, he means British, all right? Um, anyway, the name is the name is assumed to be a Celtic origin, awkward for those who believe that there was no human settlement here before the Romans built their city. Oh, by the way, this is a Mainstream published two, the year 2000 uh, by the publishers Chatto and Windus. All right, so it's a you know internationally published hardback, beautiful book. Right, so anyway, so he looks at the sources, uh, possible routes. So it might be derived from Clindon, Clindon or Clindon is Clyn, L L Y N, which is Welsh for lake or stream, and Dun is the town or stronghold. So when you see Duns all over the place, it's, it's the old British, all right? Welsh, call it if you like. Welsh is the modern form, old British language, okay? Let's call it that. Uh, so he also says its prominence may be Langdon, Long Hill, or the Gaelic. Lund, why it be Gaelic, I have no idea. Gaelic, different language, separate to Cumraig, and that's in Ireland, all right? This idea of P-Celtic, Q-Celtic, nonsense. Check it out. Two separate languages, two different origins. They're not the same. Anyway, uh, let's stick to what Peter Ackroyd has to say. So one of the more intriguing speculations, given the reputation for violence, which which London was later to acquire, is the name derived from the Celtic adjective londos, meaning fierce. I have to say, that's the first time I've seen that one. Now, this is interesting for uh, Britain's hidden history, particularly. There is a more speculative etymology, which gives the honour of naming to King Lud, who is supposed to have reigned in the century of the Roman invasion. He laid out the city streets and rebuilt its walls. Rebuilt? Notice that? Rebuilt its walls. There's already walls there. He rebuilt. So we got, we're talking very ancient. Upon his death, he was buried beside the gate which bore his name, Ludgate. And the city became known as Caer Lud, or Caer Lunding, which is Lud's city. Those of a sceptical cast of mind may be inclined to dismiss, dismiss such narratives, but the legends of a thousand years may contain profound and particular truths and he gives some other possible derivations but they're all ancient it doesn't seem to be a roman one uh, this also um explains how it could predate even the what he calls the celts i think i probably mean the Thoigris, or the, the arrival of the britons which would be the, the Thoigrans, the english uh Camry, the welsh uh Right, so he says, why is such a good spot? Because the Thames is easily navigable at this point with the Fleet and the Walbrook, they're the two rivers in London, providing, well, apart from the Thames, obviously, providing natural harbours. The ancient, ancient, ancient trackways of London, not Roman roads, all right? Ancient trackways of London were also close at hand. So from earliest time, London was the most appropriate site for trade, for markets and for barter. The city has, for much of its history, been the centre of world commerce, and it's perhaps, inst perhaps instructive to note that it may have begun with the transactions of Stone Age people in their own markets. It really is wonderful. Um, it's got things, all different things they found, different uh, streets. I mean, Tower Hill, I mean, the fact is, uh, the Gwyn, he doesn't actually mention this here, I should stick to what he says, but where the White Tower is now, Tower of London, Gwyn goes back to the Holy Mount. So, you know, all of this predates the Romans by a long way. 
Now, this is interesting as well. There are signs of prehistoric activity in the areas now known as St. Mary's Axe and Gresham Street, Austin Friars and Finsbury Circus, Bishopgate Seething Lane, and altogether some 250 finds clustered in areas of the Twin Hills together with Tower Hill. See, Tower Hill's crucial. And Southwark. That's why they put the tower there. That's why the Tower of London's there, because it's ancient and important. Same as Windsor. He's on a sacred mound. Anyway, so in the first... This is... All those people who keep banging on about this Roman. Julius Caesar, right? This is an academic writing. <clears throat> so in the first century BC, Julius Caesar's, Julius Caesar's description of the region around London suggests the presence of an elaborate, rich and well-organised tribal civilization. Its population was exceedingly large and the ground thickly studded with homesteads. The nature and role of the Twin Hills throughout this period cannot, with certainty, be given. Perhaps these were sacred places, or perhaps their well-defined position allowed them to be used as hill forts in order to protect the trade carried along the river. There is every reason to suppose that this area of the Thames was a centre of commerce and of industry, with a market in iron products, as well as elaborate workings in bronze, with merchants from Gaul, Rome and Spain bringing Samian ware, wine and spices in exchange for corn, metal and slaves. And there's other stuff about what Geoffrey of Monmouth said about it. And then we get a little mention about Trinovantes, which goes back to the origin, the Trojan origins. Uh, Trinovantium means you've got Troy, and then Novantum, the new Troy. New Troy, right? Trinovantium. <coughs> so that's mentioned. <coughs> he doesn't really go into that very much. But he does also say there is nothing is wholly lost. And he mentions books which we reference quite often on Britain's Hidden History Group. Most notably, Prehistoric London by E.O. Gordon. There's also a book here called The Lost Language of London, which I have not read yet. I'm going to try and get a copy. And The Earlier Inhabitants of London. So he says then, Tokens and traces of a Celtic or Druidic London were thoroughly examined and were found significant. Now here's the tragedy, all right? Just like with all the research into the connections between the ancient British language going all the way back to the Middle East and to hieroglyphs and Etruscan. All this was making great progress until World War I intervened and it was quietly forgotten. And this, this, yeah, it's almost heartbreaking in a way. Right, so anyway, all his studies about looking at this ancient British past in London, these studies were effectively killed off by the Second World War, after which urban planning and regeneration became more important than urban speculation. But the original works survive by the books and still repay close study. The fact that existing street names, street names may portray a Celtic origin, Colin Deep Lane, Pancras Lane, Maiden Lane, Ingle Road among them, is, for example, as instructive as any of the material finds recorded on the site of the ancient city. Names are really important, so we can't let them just be randomly changed, OK? Uh, Long-forgotten trackways have guided the course of modern thoroughfares, the crossroads at the Angel Islington, for example, marks the point where two prehistoric British roads intersected. We know of Old London Street leading to Old Ford and Maiden Lane, crossing through Pentonville and Battle Bridge to Highgate, of the route from Upper Street to Highbury, all following the same ancient tracks and buried paths. So, I mean, <clears throat> this is 2000, you know, it's like, it's an up-to-date book, and... Um, it just amazes me how this message is not getting through. We will get through. We will get through. We're going to win this year. It's very important. All right, and there's, a lot, there's a few more interesting things about the ancient stuff, which I will share. All right, so till the next time, uh, thanks for being with me. I look forward to your comments. See you again soon. Heduch.